yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rap. Other than the who's married, time, not married. Not married. Again, don't have kids before you graduate. That's, that's, that's the most important thing with databases. All right. Um, so all right, I'm going to make two corrections uh, that I, the things I, I misspoke last class. Um, so the first one, he was asking, uh, oh, does, well, he was asking how, how do we, how does BigQuery do transactions or do care about ACID? And I said, they don't do transactions, uh, which is not correct. So BigQuery actually does support multi-statement transactions. They're doing OCC and they give you snapshot isolation. So it's, this is not the, I'm not trying to say like this is the system is built to do transactions. This is something they've, they, they've had to do because people sort of ask for this. Um, one of the interesting things, so, so despite being an OLAP system, it's, it's designed to run OLAP queries really fast, but like, you know, people still want to do some transactional things on it too for updates and things like that. So BigQuery supports transactions. I know that Redshift does as well. Um, actually, a funny thing is like, we'll get this, we'll discuss this a little bit about when we talk about Photon. Like, because you're a cloud-based database system, you see all the queries. You know what your customers are doing. So you can use that to figure out what you need to optimize. In the case of Redshift, uh, they told us that they looked at the query logs and they saw people were doing a lot of updates. And like, no one has spent any time thinking how to optimize updates. So, they, so because they were seeing it so often, they went and optimized updates. So I would say that the system wasn't originally designed to support transactions, but they do, they do support it now. And then I also said that that with Hadoop, the way they did uh, shuffle is that they wrote the output of a shuffle, uh, the, sorry, output of a map task for the shuffle to HDFS. That's incorrect. It doesn't do that. He was right that they write all the shuffle data to the local disk on the data node. Right? So you don't need to do the, the triple replication that you would get with HDFS. So, uh, right, so just be mindful of these things. But again, we don't care about transactions in this class. right? They exist, but we don't care about them. Sorry. <laughs> All right. All right, so let's, before we talk about today's paper, let's talk about a little sort of history lesson, uh, again, of what led to, to Photon. So going back to the early 2010s, um, late 2000s, is when Spark, came, Spark sort of came up. Again, prior to this, the, the sort of the, the flavor of the day, if you will, in, in large-scale data processing, the, the kinds of things we care about in this class, was Hadoop. Again, Hadoop was a clone of the MapReduce framework that Google put out, or Google had. So Google wrote a paper in 2005, 2004, like here's this MapReduce thing. Uh, this is the way we're going to do all our large-scale da data an analysis. Yahoo took that and said, oh, we should do the same thing, and they wrote the, a clone of it as, as Hadoop. And then they made that open source, and a lot of people in the, in the, in the Silicon Valley and other tech companies uh, started working on it and started using it. At the, I mean, it, it has some deficiencies. There's a paper I wrote with Stonebreaker and DeWitt in the late 2000s, basically taking a on MapReduce. A bunch of stuff we say there in that paper was trying to be correct, and you know, MapReduce died out, Hadoop died out. But some of the th technology, some of the ideas that, that, that were a good ideas in MapReduce or Hadoop, landed in things like Dremel. So, all right, so Hadoop was the hot thing, but it was slow. So at Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley, they had this, this consortium similar to the PDL here at CMU uh, called the AMP Lab. And the idea is that it's a five-year program where they say, okay, we're going to build some software or build around some sort of general theme. And obviously, cloud computing was, was a big deal at the time. I mean, still big now, but it was, sort of, it was, it was the early days of it. And so they looked at how to build a better version of Hadoop, the sort of the same high-level uh, semantics, but you know, faster and, and more efficient. And so that's what Spark came out of. Spark came out of Berkeley. Uh, they open sourced it. Um, and then a lot of people started, started, started using it, and it blew up to be uh, you know, the, the juggernaut that Databricks is today. Right? So Databricks, is, the company got forked out of, out, of, out of Berkeley. A bunch of the PhD students that worked on Spark left the AMP lab, left Berkeley, went down the street to the office of where Didrick started. So it was written in Scala, um, which was the hot language, not Rust, but Scala, hot language in, in 2010. Um, and so this means that it's going to run, you know, Scala is just a you know, functional version of, of Java. Right? So it means it's going to get compiled down to Java bytecode and run in the JVM. And we haven't really talked about this semester, like, OK, how do you actually implement the, your, one of these database systems? 
right? Most of them are going to be in C++. This one, you know, Spark's going to start off in, in Java. Hadoop was written in Java as well. And the reason why this matters for this discussion today, because the, a lot of the stuff they're going to do in Photon is to deal with the fact that the, the original version of Spark SQL is in Java, which is slow and has a bunch of problems. So they're going to have a little engine that can fit into there and, and bypass the GVM as much as possible. So the original version of Spark only supported this low-level uh, query API called RD, based on RDDs, uh, resilient distributed data sets. And then I think in the early 2010s, they added support for the, the Pandas Data Frame API for high, sort of right high-level abstraction. So as far as I know, most people don't write this anymore, other than some legacy applications still using it. Everyone's going to use this Data Frame API and then also SQL as well. So people like Spark. It started getting, getting some traction. And of course, when people start having a lot of data uh, and they want to start doing analytics on it, you know, and you're not providing SQL, what are people going to ask for? SQL. And so the first version of supporting SQL in Spark was this thing called Shark, uh, which was a, was a fork of Facebook's Hive middleware, which was designed to take SQL queries, convert them to Hadoop map produce jobs, and then run them, uh, you know, run them in the cluster. So the basic idea is like, okay, well, instead of producing Hadoop jobs, we'll take SQL uh, and have Hive produce uh, Spark, Spark jobs. Right? So there were some limitations in this. It was a middleware, so it wasn't like, it's, it was a standalone thing that, or it's, it was like this software layer that sat in front of Spark. So you would submit your queries to that, and then that would then run, you know, convert them into the, to the jobs. It was just doing this sort of translation. Uh, and so that meant you could only use SQL in these, in these for Shark for data that was sitting in your, in your, in your, uh, in your data lake, before they call it data lakes, in your object store that were cataloged in the Hive metadata catalog. So you couldn't have like a Spark program where like halfway through you run a SQL query to do something, and then you take the output of that SQL query and then run more Spark jobs on it, or do, do additional things. It was, it was sort of limited what you could use it for. The other challenge that they faced was um, is that the, the query optimizer in Hive was designed specifically for, for generating MapReduce jobs. So it's, it's, it was rule-based. I think, I don't remember whether it had the cost model. Um, but it was really meant to really generate these map reduce jobs that were basically had you know, map shuffle reduce, like it was only sort of three phases. Uh, whereas in the Spark API, it was more expressive. You could do more, more, more complex transformations natively without having to do additional map reduce steps or map reduce stages. But the, the, you know, it wasn't really set up to do that. So it was generating query plans that were, um, that were maybe not as ideal as they could have been as, as compared to one that was written by hand. So Shark was the first prototype for this. Uh, and then they came up with Spark SQL, which still, still exists today. As far as I know, nobody's, I mean, Sh Shark is deprecated. That's, you know, nobody's actually running that now. Everything, you know, if you're running Spark locally without, without Photon on Databricks, and you run queries, uh, SQL queries, you're going to be running Spark SQL. So this is the second iteration of doing SQL on top of Spark. Um, and for this one, it was got to be a native a module that was native to the actual Spark runtime. So again, where Shark was a standalone middleware, like Hive is, uh, Spark SQL was actually directly inside, the, inside of uh, Spark itself, right? And so it's an in-memory, uh, it's going to use in-memory column representation for data, uh, and everything's going to be running still in the JVM. They're not doing JNI, they're not doing C++ yet. So to avoid the overhead of the JVM, you want to keep things off heap, uh, using off heap memory meaning you don't want to call it like new object because now the garbage collector is going to keep track of who references that object. You allocate some byte buffer uh, and you put all your data in there and then the, the garbage collector doesn't look at it. All right, that's the, that's the way sort of you, you write high performance uh, Java code. So they're going to do all the tricks that we talked about, so the dictionary coding, RLE, bit packing compression. Uh, they're going to do an in-memory shuffle uh, between query stages. Again, just, just like we talked about in, uh, in Dremel, except that again, it's, it's they're going to write the data locally rather than having a just separate uh, shuffle service. So they're also going to do cogen, but only for the where clauses. So they're going to take the, the, the predicates in the where clause expression, convert them into Scala ASTs, and then use the built-in Scala like JIT compiler to then convert them into to bytecode that runs and, and then run in the JVM. So they're not doing holistic query compilation that we saw in Hyper. They're only doing for, for, for the predicates themselves. 
So the, the reason why you want to use the all heap memory stuff, and we'll see this in, in Photon, is because again, if you let the garbage collector, the garbage collector has to keep track of the references. So there's a bunch of, bunch of metadata it's going to maintain about who references what. And then for every object you allocate anyway, it's going to put like 16 bytes in front of it for some you know, information about like what's the Java class that allocated this memory and so forth. Right? So if you had to keep, uh, if you had, a, you know, if you had a, like a, an, a, you know, a column of data, you don't want to store them as you know, Java integer types. You want to store them as you know, native primitive types, like the IEEE 754 standard stuff we talked about before. Right? So there's this great little bit in, in the, uh, in the in the Shark or sorry the, the Spark SQL paper where they talk about how uh, the original version when they were doing the, the memory based shuffle that they were going to write everything to disk and then hope the OS was going to keep everything in its page cache um, so that when you do the fetches from from the next stage to get things out of the shuffle that was going to be good enough right because the OS page cache would, would be able to keep keep everything in memory and of course relying on the OS is, as we said many times is a terrible idea and sure enough they talk about how uh, the syscall overhead of, of doing, you know, writing to disk and then letting the, the OS figure out when it wants to evict something, that turned out to be really terrible and made the performance be unreliable. So what do they do? Well, they're, they're database people, but it took them a while to get this. Uh, they just maintain all the memory themselves, right? Don't let the OS do anything, which is not surprising, which, again, we've talked about many times, so it's in the intro class and in this class. Actually, another thing I'll say, too, uh, what's sort of interesting about this, with Shark, right, people wanted to do SQL on Spark. And so this was sort of a stopgap solution. But Cloudera, actually, who here has heard of Cloudera before, before last class? All right, less than like four of you, right? So very few. Cloudera was the big, big Hadoop company. Uh, and they had the guy that invented Hadoop at, um, at Yahoo. He was one of the co-founders on it. It was a big deal, it had a lot of funding. And they eventually went IPO, I think, 2015. Ipocratis, who's going to come speak with us uh, about Redshift a few weeks ago, he worked there, working on Impala. Like they were, they were like the, they were the data bricks of ten years ago. And so, they never did a good job at sort of monetizing the like like open source software like Hadoop and making like a cloud offering of it. Right? There was Elastic Map Map Produce from from Amazon, and they made, they were making more money on Map Produce than than uh, you know Cloudera was. So with, with, with Shark, Cloudera actually refused to ship this in their Spark distribution, even though people wanted it, because they had Impala. Right? They wanted Impala to be the SQL and Hadoop system, and so they, didn't, they, they wouldn't ship this. Right? But everybody wanted Spark because it, it, you know, it, was, it was better than Hadoop. It was, it was, it was, people wanted this, and Cloudera was in the business of, of giving these, you know, these distributions of these open source uh, data processing frameworks. So the way the Databricks guys got around this was to then integrate SQL support directly in Spark itself. So now Cloudera has to ship Spark with their competitor's you know, software that is going to eat them alive inside you know, side of it. I'm not saying this is, this is why Databricks was successful, but this, this, this helped, to, helped with it. Right? And that's why Databricks is a huge company and Cloudera went IPO and then, as I said last class, converted back to private equity because uh, you know, they, they, they've lost the shine. So I, I, I find that super interesting that like, everybody wanted SQL, Cloud didn't, didn't want to give it because they wanted people to use Impala. So Spark says, or the database guys, okay, let's just put SQL directly inside of it. And then that, that ate, that destroyed Impala. Okay. So again, as I said, we have not talked about implementation languages at all this entire semester, but for this, this paper, you have to because it's in Java. And they're trying to deal with, in Photon, dealing with an existing environment, existing infrastructure, where they can't throw everything away and say, oh, here's the new version, because uh, that's going to be, it's a, it's a moving target, target, Spark's a moving target, it'd be very hard to replace that wholesale. So they're trying to figure out, you know, what can they do to slide something in, and then at least get a foothold, and then build out the, the, the scope in which the, the functionality of the engine, that the engine can support. So what's the problems of the JVM? So again, Spark was written in Scala because that was the hot thing. It runs with the JVM. So what they were finding in their workloads is that they are becoming more and more CPU bound. Um, and this is surprising in a, for, in a, in a large scale like OLAP system that's processing a lot of data because you would think reading data from disk should be the bottleneck. 
right? That's the, that's the conventional wisdom. But now if, you're, if your engine is so slow, then the disk no longer becomes the bottleneck, or the disk is getting really fast, and you can start skipping things or throwing things out because you're doing better filtering with indexes and, and zone maps and other stuff. Right? So they're finding over time that the, 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 the queries themselves are becoming CPU bound uh, in the GVM because they're all the advancements in, in the hardware and doing a better job at, at throwing things away without having to read it. So what they were finding is that the, with the Spark SQL engine, it was really hard for them to make it go faster because it was, you know, it's in the JVM. Uh, the code gen code was difficult to maintain because it was only people that had experience actually working in the internals of the JVM were, you know, could actually manipulate that piece of, of the system. If the heap size got larger than 64 gigabytes, um, then the garbage collector became a huge bottleneck. Even though you're putting things off heap as much as possible, uh, it's, you know, there's, still, there's, there's still overhead of other metadata. Um, now there are, uh, I don't know how much you guys know about Java. There are, there's like the open JDK and there's like the, the, the Oracle JDK or JVM. But there's also actually high performance ones that are like proprietary, like cost a lot of money. I think Azul is probably the most famous one. Like this is what, if the high frequency, high frequency trading guys are gonna be using J Java, they're gonna be using one of these very expensive, like, you know, uh, you know j strip down JVMs that don't have, the, you know, the, the garbage collection overhead of, um, of like the, the open source version. But again, at their scale, they weren't going to, you know, they can't pay that. So, all right, so the, the garbage collector is going to be a problem. And then they were finding also, too, for the, for the cogen piece that I talked about for, the, for, for expressions in, in Spark SQL, that for really complex queries or, query, or, or doing queries on, a, on tables with a lot of columns, the size of the, of the, the, of the, the code they would have to generate to evaluate the, the predicate became too large for for Scholar or the JVM, and it would throw errors, and so then they, they had to fall back to the slower Volcano-style interpreted engine. Um, so they, this, this, this problem came up so much that they realized that, you know, they can't proceed forward with trying to make the JVM or, or Java-based engine work faster, and they had to switch to something, uh, and that was Photon. So, all right, so what is actually Photon? So it's not a standalone database system like we've talked about for a bunch of other uh, uh, systems so far, and, and for what we'll talk about going forward. Um, it's, you can sort of think of it as a library uh, that provides a single-threaded execution engine that does, uh, you know, that, that executes portions of a, of a query plan. And there's a bunch of work they have to do to get the data in back and forth between, between Java land, between the Java code, uh, that, that, that they're going to support as well. So if anybody's here written like a C++ module that, that runs, or C, something in C that runs in Java, you use the JNI, the Java Native Interface. And it's basically, they expose like, these uh, function calls that you have to implement to, to, to allow Java to call into C++, or, or, or C, whatever, whatever you want it to be, right? So they want to, again, the reason why they have to do this is because they have an existing user base. It's running already Spark SQL or, or these, these you know, Spark jobs in Java, and because Spark is a actively worked on project, both within Databricks and outside Databricks, it'd be, it would be very difficult for them to say, okay guys, let's rewrite everything and put it in C++. So the idea was they would have a way to, to slide in a Photon as this, this library that can implement some of the things that Spark does, like the, the, mo the, mo you know, the most expensive operations, the most CPU intensive operations, Replace those from the, from the Java stuff into C++. And then over time, as the uh, replace more and more pieces of Spark and have it call down through JNI to, to uh, Photon. And you obviously want, to be, when you want this to be seamless. You want to avoid, uh, you, don't, you don't want people to realize, or people to notice that, like, okay, my query ran today. I got one result. It runs tomorrow. I get a completely different result because today, you know, some Photon added more features, and I'm getting different results. So it'll, you can think of Photon almost like, a, like, a, like an execution library, like Velox, which we'll cover in a few weeks, right? It's not a system you can like, you know, run as its own daemon and, and run queries on it, right? It still has to exist inside the, the Spark engine. So the paper also talks about, too, uh, we'll talk about in a second, well, this Databricks runtime, DBR. So this is basically, my understanding is the same thing as, as the open source version of Spark except they forked it and there's a bunch of stuff that Databricks has added to make it better that they don't put in the open source version, right? That's their business model. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, 
But that's, that's instead of saying the Spark engine, it's DBR, but they're basically the same thing. So I would say using JNI isn't always easy. Uh, it's, if you want to, if you want to copy data back and forth, it can be expensive, but if you're just calling down to do something, let it, let it crunch and then come back up. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. And it's interesting because the conventional wisdom has always sort of been that, you know, JNI can be slow. Um, but in the paper, they talk about how in their measurements, the overhead of making a call from Java through JNI to C++ code is equivalent to like a C++ uh, virtual, virtual function table lookup, uh, which was, to me, that was surprising, but it kind of makes sense. Right? If you don't have to marshal data or do any deserialization of things back and forth, then it's obviously, it's, it's just making a call into to C++. So I want to point out one thing about this paper you got, have you guys read, or have you guys read for this class. Uh, in the author list, there's a lot of CMU people, and a lot of people have taken this class. Uh, <laughs> so Prashant Menon was my PG student. Uh, he took this class, he TA'd the class. Yud Karsh and Arvin were master students here at CMU. They took this class uh, with me. Ryan Johnson is actually finished his PhD here at CMU before I started, I think in 2010. Uh, and so technically, I think he took this class, but, but like in 2006, 2005. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's, and there's more people. If you go, I mean, if you go look in the, um, if you go look in the, uh, the, the citation list, there's a blog article from Allison. She was my student. She took this class, right? There's, there's a lot, of, like, a lot of people at Databricks now from CMU. Um, so this is why I was excited to see how many people there are, are on this. Okay. I would say, yeah, that's why you should take this class. We're, we're like, what, 12 weeks in? <laughs> it's, it's, what's that? I, almost, I said that's exactly why you should take this class. Well, yeah, we're, we're 12 weeks into it, so it's like I've already sold that to you guys. Okay. All right, so let's go high level. What, what is Databricks Photon? I've already said it's not a standalone system. It's its own execution engine. So some of these things that I'll talk about are going to be part of the overall Spark runtime, uh, and where some of these will be specific to, to Photon. Um, and in particular, we're going to focus most of our time talking about the, how they do uh, vectorized query processing, because that part is unique. And it's sort of tied to how they do pre compiled primitives and expression fusion. But just like in Dremel, they're going to be doing shuffle based, uh, or just shuffle, shuffle based distributed execution. But again, unlike in Dremel, where they had a dedicated shuffle store, they're going to be storing shuffle data locally uh, and have, have the other workers pull from it. They're going to, do, they're going to support both sort merge and hash joins. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about this also too, how they do query optimization. And like Dremel, they also support a, uh, some adaptive query execution uh, methods as well. It's, it's quite similar. And we'll, again, when we discuss Snowflake on, on Monday next week, they'll have, have, it'll basically be almost the exact same thing of all the same stuff, except for they don't, really, they don't always do shuffle. Okay, right, so how does Spark execute queries. Again, this is, this is Spark the overall system, not specific to Photon, because Photon has no notion of network communication and workers. It just, it's the, like the, the little the library of kernels that it runs to execute queries. So just like in Dremel, we have a distributed file system, a bunch of files. Uh, the first stage, they're going to go pull some data from, from the, the distributed file system. They're going to crunch on it. But again, unlike in Dremel, which has a dedicated uh, in-memory shuffle store, they're going to store all the shuffle data locally. Uh, in memory, and it, it could spill to disk if necessary. And again, as I said, they control this, this, these OS memory allocations or OS al memory allocations. They're not letting the OS doing any, do any paging. Then in the second stage, all the executors are going to retrieve. In the next stage, going to pull data from uh, the previous stage, do whatever computation they want on that, same thing, store it locally, and then push it out to the next executor. Right? And then there's all this mechanism that Spark provides of how to do fault, maintain fault tolerance, and if one executor goes down, how do you make sure that like, the task gets rescheduled? All that we don't, we don't care about right now or for this class, or for this, this discussion. But it, it, all that exists. And then that's, a, that's provided by Spark. That's, that's not provided by uh, Photon. And so Photon is basically going to be like a little piece inside each executor, where as you're running the query, it's the, the system is going to decide, OK, well, I have a Photon version of this operator. I'll make sure that I call, call that instead of the, the original Java version. So the Photon engine itself is going to be doing pool-based uh, vectorized execution uh, using pre-compiled primitives at the operator level. And so we talked about this before when we talked about vector-wise. Right, vector-wise the, would have all the, have the, like the software developers, people building the data systems, they would write all these primitives, or what, what Databricks calls kernels, to do some small operation. 
scanning a table or probing a hash table, doing comparison in some expression. They're going to write all this ahead of time in templated C++, uh, and then that then gets expanded out to com different compiled versions that are optimized for different data types and different data layouts and so forth. All right? So that's how they're going to get uh, you know they're going to get better performance without being a cogen engine by having things still be compiled. And then you basically now when you execute a query, it's a bunch of pointer calls to, to these functions to, to do whatever processing on, on the data that, that they're given. And you say, okay, well, function call per, you know, per piece of data would be expensive. Well, it's amortized over time because they're dealing with these, these column batches or ch chunks of data. So, again, what I like about this paper is they have commentary about, oh, we thought about this. We tried this, this other technique, and it turns out it was hard or, or like it sucked. It wasn't as good. And here's why we, did the, here's why we made the decisions we did. This is fantastic. Most times in industry papers, you just see, okay, we do it this way. We can't tell you why, but trust us, it's the right thing, right? I like this paper because they talk about, even if they don't have numbers that show it, they say, we tried this, we looked at this, here's what worked and here's what didn't work. So in particular, what I like about it, one of the key things is that they discuss how it's, they found it to be easier to build, maintain, and optimize a vectorized engine with pre-compiled primitives than trying to build a JIT engine. And certainly they had experience building a JIT engine because they did that with Spark SQL. Like trying to compile, compile expressions. And so what they talk about is that when they, when they were trying to build the new version of Photon, or were trying to build Photon, they tried doing you know, C++ code gen, the way uh, we've talked about it with Hyper. And what they found is that their engineers are spending more time uh, writing all the infrastructure you need, the tooling you need to debug and understand what the hell the compiled program is actually doing than actually trying to write the engine itself. So again, when if you do like the hyper approach where you, you, you generate LLM and IR, compile it, and then that's your query plan, you run it. When you crash, you don't have symbols, you're sitting in x86 assembly, There's, you know, it's not a pretty stack trace. You have to write then a bunch of tools to be able to reverse that back and figure out, okay, what was the code that generated the code that crashed? And the hyper guys can do it because they're German, right? <laughs> but, but it's a lot of work. And so what they said is better to have, uh, your engineers just write the additional uh, code paths or primitives that are specialized to different scenarios. Uh, and we'll talk about one that's beyond just like different data types. Uh, you know, and then you get the, since it's just C++ code, you get to use all of the debugging tools, instrumentation tools, pro uh, pro profiling tools that exist today uh, and make the system better. So they talk about how because, uh, because you're not writing tooling infrastructure and just writing the engine itself, you can get closer to the, 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 the performance you would get if you were doing complete code gen in the way that Hyper does it. So I'm certainly, you know, my student Prashant, he built a code gen engine for us. He built two versions of this. Uh, and the second one he built was sort of designed to make it easier for people to debug and actually, uh, you know, for students to work, actually work on. Um, and it's true, his version, the second version that was in noise page was easier to debug and easier to maintain and more students could work on it but it was still, you know, it was still a small subset of all the students that, that, that worked with us. Because again, if it crashes, now you're, like, you have to sit through an interpreter and try to figure out what's going on. Um, so I would agree with this, that like, I think this, this makes sense. That if you're gonna build a system, this is going for it, this is the way to do it. It's just not worth the engineering overhead to do cogen um, for, you know, for, for, the, for the entire queries. Okay. The other things you get benefit also too, if you have, you know, if you, I guess you would have complete control with this in, um, in CoGen, but like not relying on the on on the JVM and other stuff. Like you, they have control of what what, what gets vectorized. Right? They talk about how auto vectorization actually works pretty good because the primitives are, are kind of small, but in some cases they they do use intrinsics to do direct uh, vectorization. All right, so every operator is going to support uh, the, the get net function or next function. Um, and then what they're going to produce, because it's vectorized query processing, is a vector or a, a, batch, a batch of, uh, of, of tuples. So in this paper, they call, them, they call them column batches. So a column batch is going to be one or more column vectors with a position list that tells you which, uh, which offsets in the vectors are going to be are considered active. Right? You sort of think of like I'm calling uh, 
you know, a bunch of filter primitives to start pruning things out, as we talked about when, when we talked about vectorized execution, and you need to keep track of which filters, or which tuples pass each filter. So they're going to be using an offset list that says, you know, the offset in the array for the, the different columns, these are the ones that are actually, are actually still valid. And then, if you, obviously, if this thing goes, goes to, to, to empty, or it goes, the size is zero, then you know none of the tuples have passed it. You, you, can, you can short circuit the execution for this. So in the paper, they mentioned that they also considered using what we saw before in, when we talked about vectorization, using a, like a bitmap of, of the actor rows. Right? So the size of this bit set is going to be the same number of columns, or sorry, number of tuples you have in, in your columns. Right? So like, you know, this is set to zero, then this column is not active, it's set to one. So if, if this is set to zero, this row is, is inactive. If it's set to one, then the row is active. Right? And they say that in their experiments, it turns out that using the position list, although it seems like this would be more expensive, because you've got to basically you know, loop through this thing and look at, oh, should, should I look at uh, a given tuple, they have this little line here that says why it turns out to be not the case that the bitmap is, is not faster. Right? Because you're, you're basically dealing with a, a you're iterating over, over a smaller array to figure out what, what gets active. And so they have this, this little blob down here. Recent work confirms our conclusions. Did anybody follow this, this, this citation? It's our paper, right? Uh, written, came out of this class. Amadou took 721. Uh, now he's a PhD student at MIT. Prashant, we, we know about. Matt, you know about. Lin Wan, and then Todd Mowry. Right? So this paper, he basically, Amadou basically did a, almost like a brute force sweep over all different variations of represent filters, represent you know, the active row set or the position list. Uh, and just and figured out under, under what conditions one is better than another. Um, and in most cases, again, the position list is going to be better. It's only for like, really extreme examples where uh, the, the bitmap is better. Okay. So, uh, all right, I've already said before that they're not going to be doing uh, the hyperstyle, or sorry, they're not doing hyperstyle uh, query, holistic query compilation. And as, as a byproduct of that, they're also not doing that sort of push base operator fusion model that, that, that Hyper does. And beyond just sort of engineering effort to do that, they also make a good point that if you fuse operators, then it's difficult to be able to show to the user a nice you know, uh, information about where the, their, you know, why their query might be running slow, or what part of the query plan is actually you know, is, is going to be slow. Is it this operator versus that operator? Because again, things get fused together, and there's no longer a, a clean map between here's a logical query plan or here's a, you know, even a physical query plan to the actual runtime in the code. So uh, this is my term, vertical versus horizontal fusion. So they're not going to do vertical fusion where within multiple operators vertically in a pipeline, you're going to collapse them down into some small kernel. They're not going to do that, but instead they're going to do what are called horizontal fusion within a single operator I'll fuse together a bunch of things that would be separate primitives into a single primitive, and that way it's less function calls in, into that. And I'll, I'll show what I mean in a second. Again, as, as a reminder, as we saw this before when we talked about hyper and, and, and cogen, uh, you have some complex query here, it gets converted into this query plan, and then we have the boundaries for, the, for those pipelines, right? And so for, for things like, say, the first pipeline, it's scanning over a table and then applying the filter. Well, okay, that one is sort of as a, as a, is small enough for you to explain to somebody where the, the, where the time being spent. Except that you're also doing you're also doing materialization of a hash table. Uh, but I think the one that clearly sh could would, would show you the problem with with operator fusion and, and showing to users how much time is being spent is the fourth pipeline, right? So I'm scanning C, probing hash table on B, and then probing hash table on A. That's three nested for loops. So how would you tell someone, oh yeah, this query time is, is being spent all in this join when it's all sort of in, in this, you know, in a bunch of for loops. You can't show people for loops and say, hey, you're, here's where your time is being spent because they're not going to know what the hell you're talking about. Right? So again, they're not doing this, not just for, for engineer reasons, but also I think for, for usability reasons to, to, to end customers, which I think is a fair point. And it's not something people in academia usually think about. All right, so what they are doing instead is, again, horizontal fusion within, within uh, predicates, with, uh, yeah, with, within different predicate primitives. So, let's, so they have this example here. Let's say I'm doing a, a select star from foo where some date is between 
you know, the beginning of the year and beginning of this month. Well, between calls is just two ands, right? Greater than or equal to and less than or equal to. So they, they comment in the paper how they see this, this pattern all the time. And so if you were doing the precompiled primitives the way that Vectorwise describes how has it is done, you would have one primitive that do the greater than or equal to for the first date, and then another primitive would do the, greater, the less than or equal to for the second date. And so what would happen is you would, you would for every single, in your loop, for every single tuple or batch of, or column batch as you're, as you're processing, you would then make a call into th this, you would get back your position list, then make another call into this function passing the, the previous position list, uh, and then do that processing. So it seems kind of trivial, two function calls. But again, think of like if I'm scanning a terabyte of data, I forget what their column batches are. I, 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 actually, I don't think the paper says, say, a thousand tuples. Right? If I have a billion tuples and I'm broken up to a thousand chunks, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of function calls. And so an easy optimization that they do is that they would, again, this is why, this is why they don't want to be a cogen engine. If, they, if you're vectorized, you can find these scenarios where this, this occurs. And then you can build a specialized version of the, the predicate where you see some pattern over and over again. So now I can do the between clause where I pass in the low and the high and, and do the comparison. Right? So again, it, it seems sort of obvious, but uh, you, know, you need the telemetry of the system and you need to know what query theory are running in order to make, make these decisions. Because they're a cloud-based system, they have all that. Right? In the old days, if you're on-prem, if you're, you're shipping on-prem software, you would only find out what people cared about, if one, if you asked them, which is expensive and time consuming, and people usually don't know what they want. Um, or then if something crashes and you, you, you get like a, you know, a you know, debug statement or something like that, and you can figure out what's going on. But being in the cloud, you, you see everything, and you can, you can you know, make decisions based on it. So again, this is what I'm, I'm calling this horizontal fusion, because again, within an operator, I'm fusing multiple primitives together. And the idea applies to a bunch of other things. Okay. So the memory management is for them is a big deal too because they're, they're, they're hanging out in Java or they have to deal with Java. So it seems kind of intuitive, but all my understanding is all the memory allocations that the Photon would make in C++ are going to be done through this memory allocator uh, or memory manager up in running in the JVM. So you, know, yes, you would ask the, the unified memory manager, give me a chunk of memory, and it's just a pointer that gets passed down to C++ that, that it can use. It doesn't matter whether it was malloced by C++ or Java, it's memory is memory, and it can just use it. So what's interesting, one of the things they talk about in the paper is that, I mean, you obviously want to do this because you don't want to have a sort of separate memory pool for Photon and a separate memory pool for the Java stuff. You want to have a single memory pool, and that way it's easier to do reporting to, 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 you know, to show to like either the operator or the customer, here's how much memory this node is, being, is using and so forth. Keep track of the runtime usage. Um, and you know, certainly Spark already had a memory manager, so why, why write another one? Just use that one. But what's interesting about it is that they talk about, uh, that the other papers don't talk about, is of how they're going to spill the disk when they, when they run out of memory, when, when there's memory pressure for these different operators. So we didn't really talk about in this class, like, OK, when do you actually spell a disk? It's basically the same technique that we talked about in the intro class. I have a buffer pool, I'm, or I'm given some, some fixed allocation of my hash table to do a join. And then if I exceed the size, then the buffer pool will spill things to disk. Right? It, it'll run slow, but, it, it, but it's better than crashing. So what they, they take a different approach, and they separate the, 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 the memory allocation from the sort of releasing of memory as sort of two separate processes. Um, so they, it allows one operator, one component running the system uh, to free up memory to make space for another component at the same time. So, so no longer is your component responsible for recognizing, I'm going to run out of memory. Let me start me spilling the disk. You run out of memory. You go ask the memory allocator for more memory. Then it decides who should then release that memory. And the reason why they want to do this, as they talk about in the paper, is because they're dealing with data that they've never seen before. They don't have any statistics. They don't know how much work you're actually going to do, how much memory you're going to need for different operators. So you need to be more dynamic in your allocations. Right? In Postgres, the way it works is you define, here's how much memory I want my hash table to use as the initial allocation. And then if I get it wrong, then I have to you know, double the size and, and run it again. 
All those systems, if you run out of memory, it, it'll you know, throw an error and abort the query. That's not ideal either. So the way it's going to work is they, if you need more memory, you go, you go to the memory manager, you ask for more, and then it decides who to kill, and they use a simple heuristic where they sort all the, the, the so the, the concurrent operations that are holding memory, you sort them by the least, uh, the least amount to the greatest amount, and whatever operator has the most, has the most memory, or sorry, the least amount of memory that is enough to satisfy the request, it gets told to, to release this memory. All right, so every, everybody has to be dynamic, which I think, I think is kind of clever. All right, so let's talk about query optimization. So this paper doesn't really talk about the query, query optimizer. There was a, in the Spark SQL paper from 2015-16, um, they talk about this, the, the catalyst query optimizer. Um, and so again, what, what, what the things I'll talk about here will be a little bit from what Spark does, but I'll mostly focus on what they've added to Catalyst to make it work for, for Photon. So Catalyst is a cascade-style query optimizer, written in Scala, of course. Um, and it's going to do the transformations in, in predefined stages very similar to the SQL Server uh, talk that you guys watched before. And these, these stages are defined by the software engineers to decide, OK, when should I actually apply this? And because, again, they're not going to rely on this, this, this fantastic cost model, or because you know, they're not going to have statistics for, for random data uh, that are sitting in a, in a data lake, a lot of the optimizations they're going to be doing are going to be sort of heuristic-based, at least enough to get them close enough to a good plan. And then at runtime, they'll, they'll be able to adapt a little bit to, to fix things up. So one big difference, though, about Catalyst versus the other uh, you know, or the, the tr traditional way people think of cascades is that they're going to be able to do logical to logical transformations and logical to physical transformations, but then they're also going to be doing physical to physical transformations. And this is how Photon's going to work, or how they're going to integrate Photon. So they're going to generate a physical plan uh, you know, using the normal process, but then there'll be an extra, extra step or stage that looks at, OK, what portions of the physical plan that I have now can I offload into Photon? And then I'll transform it to the physical plan to another physical plan. So these labels here, analysis and optimization rules, strategies, procedures, this is what Databricks calls these things. Uh, but my understanding is it's logical, logical, phys logical, physical, and physical, physical. So I mean, I don't want to say that SQL Server doesn't do this. There's, 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 that, there's that extra step where they talk about how there's another, like for the different engines that are using their Cascades optimizer, the query optimizer, they can do additional transformations, like uh, to convert a, a single node query plan to a distributed query plan. So I shouldn't say that like, not everyone, no, nobody else does this, but it's, they're, Databricks is doing this specifically for Photon in a, in a certain way. But it's, it, I guess it's, it's, it's equivalent to I guess what, what, what the SQL Server guys were doing. All right, so the physical physical transformation. The idea here is that they want to traverse the query plan from bottoms up and figure out what portions could, again, could be moved into to a Photon plan. And the thing they have to be mindful about is the, the, the amount of back and forth they're doing between going from Java world to C++ world. Because again, they have to, the, the, the Spark SQL engine is row based. The Photon engine is columnar based. So you have to pivot and convert things as you go back and forth. So you don't want to do that like back and forth over and over again because you'll be spending most of your time doing that transformation rather than actually processing the query. So they go bottoms up to make sure that, uh, you know, that they don't do a transformation. They, they know how many transformations that they've done below, and they're not making weird ones in the middle. The idea is that you figure out where, where, what point can I start converting things to Photon, and how far can I go up into a pipeline or a query plan. So here's a, a, a basic example, right? So it's I, I scan some file, I do a filter, I do a shuffle, and then I produce an output here. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll figure out, OK, well, the, the filter and the shuffle, I have Photon versions of those things. So my physical plan will now convert those into specific operators that Photon that supports. But then I have to add in this, what they call an adapter, or the trans transition operator here, to, to make the JNI calls into, into C++, and then the, the return call back into Java with the result. So the way thing is like this side of here, this is all the Java stuff, the JVM, and then over here is all C++. Is that sort of clear? All right, so again, this happens before you start running the query. Uh, 
like you, the physical plan before you start executing it in, in the overall system, it'll, it'll make this decision. And then at runtime, they're going to do two types of adaptations. So the first one we'll call query level ad adaptivity or macro adaptivity. This is very similar to the Dremel stuff we talked about before, where the, the system is, is recognizing that the, the shape of the data or the, the size of the data or the distribution of the data is different than maybe it had anticipated, and it can make some high-level changes to the query plan itself. Again, this is not being done by Photon. This is being done by the higher-level part of, of Spark, so, so the, the Databricks runtime or the Spark runtime. The thing that is specific to Photon is what they call batch level adaptivity, where within the, while you're actually running the, like the, 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 the kernel loops, you recognize, okay, data looks differently than I expected, or looks a certain way, or has different properties, then they'll choose different pre-compiled primitives to invoke for the data that they're looking at. And we'll go through examples of both of these. So I'll say, I think this existed before, before Photon, and then this is obviously photon specific. All right, so for the dynamic query optimization for at the Spark level, again, this looks a lot like Dremel. It's basically the same thing. Right? You, you, they're doing shuffle uh, in between stages. So it's a nice, uh, the, the, you know, at the end of a stage, you have a bunch of data in, the, in your shuffle buffers. It's the right time to go look at it, the query plan. Am I going to do? It, am I doing the right thing for given the data that I've seen? Because right, they didn't have a cost model when they were doing query optimization, so they couldn't predict exactly what the data was going to look like. But at the shuffle phase, you have that data, so you can make the right decisions or make better decisions. So just like before in Dremel, they can switch between a shuffle and a broadcast join. They'll call us partitions. We'll show in the next slide. This is, they're, they're actually this one looks the way they do it is more primitive than um, than what Dremel does, in my opinion. Uh, and then they'll also be able to dynamically optimize a uh, skew join or potentially also change, change the join order. So let's see how they do the coalescing. So unlike in Dremel, where Dremel would, uh, it would recognize that it had pressure on a, on a partition and then start spilling it or split it into to multiple partitions. Um, as far as I can tell, Spark can't do that. They can only combine partitions that are underutilized. So the way they do this is they sort of over-allocate the number of partitions you expect to come out of a, of, of a, of a, of a, of a worker, um, you know, large enough to, so that like, things don't get, get start, start spilling to disk. And then after the shuffle completes, you go back and look, figure out which ones are underutilized, and then combine them. Right? So say my worker is producing some output. I fill in, fill in these, these five partitions. But then I recognize that these three here are, are underutilized. So I can take their result. Again, this is all local done at the worker. There, there isn't a distributed service. You just combine them. And then for the other two that were completely full, you just you know, carry them over. And then now you can then adjust the number of workers that may be coming on the other side that are, that are pulling data from this. And the reason why this matters, of course, if you have there's fewer partitions, then there's fewer tasks you need to consume them. Uh, and there's less pressure on resources and less pressure on the uh, you know, for sch the scheduler. I forget what the, the I, actually I don't remember what the default partition size they said was. It might have been like 64 megabytes or something like that. So again, they do this because they don't know what the the data is going to look like coming out of the worker because they don't know how to predict selectivities of filters, joins, and other operators. So you just allocate a, 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 enough memory, fill it up, and then combine it together if. Uh, once you realize that they're, you overpredicted. All right, the thing that is more interesting is how they do the batch level ad adaptivity. So I'm going to highlight sort of three ideas here. They have a little example of a template of C++ code in, in the paper. Uh, I didn't show that because, well, I guess I, I, I could have shown it, but it's the, explaining, I think, is, is easy enough. So again, the idea here is that because a query plan that's running is basically a list of pointers to these precompiled primitives, there's no reason you can't swap out one pointer with another to a different function, as long as it's doing the same, same, same high-level operation uh, at runtime, based on how you, how, you know, what the data actually looks like. So one of the optimizations they talk about is that, that people do all sorts of weird encoding for strings. 
and sometimes the data will be ASCII encoding, sometimes it'll be Unicode, UTF-H, or UTF-8 coding. ASCII encoding is always going to be one, one byte per character, right? It's, it's always eight bits. In UT, UTF-8, it's, it's variable. It can either one, two, three, or four bytes, depending on what character set you're, you're using. So if you assume everything's going to be UTF-8, then you have to use a slower version of a bunch of uh, you know, string operator functions because it has to account for that variability in the data you're looking at. But if you can recognize that, oh, for this column I'm looking at, it's always going to be ASCII, ASCII data, then I can use Swiss use an optimized version of that. So they talk about how they have a basic way to detect as you're scanning data, oh, this is always ASCII data for this column. So let me make sure I always use the ASCII versions of, of the pre-compiled primitives because that's going to be faster. They also keep track of, for, for column batches, uh, within a column, if there's no null values, then I don't need to check for nulls. Right? And in, in the example in the paper, they show how it's a templated function. And the compiler is smart enough to recognize that if you pass in that I'm not going to check for nulls uh, for this pre compiled function, it just, the, that, that line of code gets compiled away. So you would have a, a version of a, a primitive that would check for nulls, and another one wouldn't check for nulls. And if you know there's no nulls, you, you use the faster one. Similarly, you'd have the same thing for, uh, for in the column batch. If you know that there's no, uh, if you know that there's always, all the columns are activated, basically your position list contains all the all possible offsets, then you don't need to go check at every single record as you, in, in your loops, is, this, is the row I'm looking at even, even active or not? I mean, you lied all that. And again, it removes indirection, which is a bad thing in, uh, in superscalar CPUs, as we said. So, so things will run faster. So again, they can do this switching on the fly as the query is running based on the data that, that they're seeing. And obviously, you need fallback mechanisms if you get it wrong, uh, you know, how to handle that. All right, so this paper actually has benchmark results uh, for, picked up for TPCH. I don't know why that one's there. I can't get rid of that. Um, but this is basically, they have benchmark results because they're comparing against themselves, which is nice like before and after, right? So the gray bar is the old Spark SQL engine, and then the, the red bar is, their, uh, is, is the new Photon engine. And then the main takeaway is, obviously, it's faster. Uh, for, you know, for this query in particular, because it's, they're relying on the C++ decimal uh, implementation versus like the Java one. And it's, it's just so much faster, yes? I, I, I can't remember what I said. I, I, I don't remember. I think. Yes, it's, I think it's just a scanning line item. It's oh, pretty okay. simple. That's yeah. Fair. But I don't know why. Yeah, in this case, it's very fast, yes. Yeah. And again, the main takeaway here it's not surprising the Simples engine is faster than the Java one. Yes. I, f I forget the details of this. I, I have to go look at what they said. You just oh. tag Rohan on Slack. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way that's Sorry, that's, uh, that's Oracle. Yeah. This, this is Databricks. No, but like the Java decimal implementation. Oh, 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 oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't remember whether it was fixed point or not. I, oh. Yeah. But it, yeah, actually, if, if it was fixed point in Java, then it would have to be fixed point in Photon. And so I, I can imagine that, that, that would make a difference, certainly. But they implemented in C++, right? Yeah, but you, you basically have to go, you would have to implement, like if they're using a fixed point decimal type then that's in Java, like I, don't, I, don't, I doubt it's big, de big decimal, but something like that, you have to re-implement the same thing in C++ to have the same semantics. And I don't think they did that. I don't know whether it's, it's fixed point or floating point. It's in the paper. We, we can go look at it again. All right, so they also have this other blurb at the end, if you notice. They talk about TPCDS numbers. Um, and in 2021, as part of this paper, Databricks made a huge announcement about how they have official audited TP, you know, TPCDS results. So TPCH came out in the 90s, TPCDS, the DS stands for data science came out the 
think the, the 2000s. TPCH is considered deprecated. TPCDS is what everyone is supposed to be the, the, the benchmark everyone should be using, but like it's more complicated. There's 100 queries, there's CTEs. Like it's, it's easier to get TPCH running instead of TPDS. Uh, but so that's why a lot of papers we read, they only look at TPCH. But TPC, like if you want to actually test your system, you would want to, uh, a modern system, you'd want to use TPCDS. So this is the web page. It's straight out of the 2000s, but it is what it is. But this is, uh, this is the official results here. So at, for 100,000 gigabyte results, Databricks is, is the champion. Below this is Alibaba for doing MapReduce. Uh, and they're, they're faster and they're, they're cheaper and faster. All right. So they made a big deal about this announcement. Um, and, and when this came out, uh, and there was a bunch of like, articles like this that talks about how Databricks has official numbers for TPCDS, and they're trying to go after uh, you know, Snowflake, take, take over Snowflake. Um, we'll talk about the benchmarks next class, but for this particular article here, uh, they asked me to give a quote in it about the significance of these TPCDS results. Uh, and this is actually not the full quote. They cut it off. So at the enterprise level, maybe some CIO, chief information officer, is going to care about what your official TPC ranking is, but they don't make sales that way. And only old people care about TPC results. That was the, that was the full quote. <laughs> <laughs> so, does anybody know what TPC is? I mean, we talked about TPCH, TPCDS, right? So TPC stands for the Transaction Processing Council. It's a nonprofit consortium that was set up in the late '80s by Jim Gray and some other database people as a way to have a uh, unbiased, you know, nonpartisan official referee for benchmark results. Because prior to this, prior before TPC, TPC was set up, all the vendors had their own little benchmarks, of course, that showed that their system was faster than anything else. Right? There wasn't a standard uh, workload that, that benchmark that everyone could use to actually do fair apples to apples comparisons. Right? So T TPC was set up. I think the first benchmark was TPCA. TPC A and B, like, it's like think of like transactions. It was early transactional workloads. And it's funny, you go read the early papers about like the, when they set up TPC, they'd be like, oh, it wouldn't be great if we could run 100 transactions a second, right? Like, like for them, that, that was wild. That was the vision. Um, so, so there's a bunch of these different benchmarks, TPC DS, TPC C, TPC E, uh, and so forth. Um, I think, how do I say this? This doesn't matter. Uh, well, how does it? Nobody cares about this anymore. Like, it's a nice to have, uh, but like nobody's making decisions. Oh, your TPC DS re results, the official audit results are amazing. People, so people put out put out TPCH results all the time. You, you're not supposed to be able to call it TPCH unless it's actually officially audited. But nobody actually checks this anymore. So like, it's nice to have these standard workloads that everyone can use. But I don't think. That, I, I think we've moved past the need for like a consortium like this to, to, to check things. Actually, they told me that they had to go, they, they didn't have anybody actually that could audit this. They had to pull somebody out of retirement to come help them audit this. Because again, nobody was there to actually check this stuff anymore. Uh, so I still stand by my statement, only old people care about this. Um, it's a nice to have, but it's, it's not, it, no startup is going to, Except for Databricks, because they had money. Nobody's going to make the time, spend the time to actually care about, they try to get ranked here. Yes? So what should you care about if you're not caring about like, how fast your system is? No, not about the Or the particular TPCA. So, like, so like, I mean, at the end of the day, you should care about what you're workloading in your application, right? Oh, well, that, it's, very, like, applica it's very, like, specific now, because there's too many, like, is it, well, no, I'm asking a question. Is it, like, too specific? Because, like, there's, like, DB set, like, DB methods that do like one thing, or like, you know, DB or like array DB methods, which like, you know, do another thing. Right. Is it like that now? I mean, so, so there are, so I, so I think there's like standard benchmarks people use that you can use to evaluate these different systems. Uh -huh. um, the, the end of the day, like if you're, if you're, if you're a user and you need to make a decision, you care about your workload. Like you don't care about their TPC DS results if your thing is doing, you know, if, the, if your thing doesn't look like TPC DS, right? Now this will be th this, these results, and not official results, just running TPC DS, which you can do. 
those, like, that'll be a good, at least give you a starting point to understand the, the pros and cons of one system versus another. But I would argue, too, that a lot of things we talked about in this, this semester, they're basically being commoditized. Like, every system does vectorized execution now. And the things that you're going to care about is how good the query optimizer is, how good the user interface is, right? Certainly how much it costs. Those are the things I think would, would, would make a, a decision, should be helping you decide whether to pick one system over another, right? Um, I'm just saying that like, like for them to spend the time to get it officially ranked and beat Alibaba, like, I don't. I don't care. Yes. Wasn't it a pretty effective boxing stunt against Netflix? Uh, to have official numbers. Yeah. Uh, well, I said, well, <laughs> except they asked me, and I said I don't care. Um, I, mean, I don't think anybody knows. Uh, I don't think nobody knows what TPCDS is. Like you can come out of the gate and say I'm faster than you sat faster than Snowflake. Here's some results, and then not do this. Right. I mean, within the database. We'll cover this in the next class. Like there's a there's there's a there's a back and forth between when this came out, I said who cares? Snowflake then did a did a retort and said like you ran Snowflake wrong. And Databricks said no, we ran it right. Like they went back and forth on this. Somebody open sourced their like code and benchmarking or whatever, so you can actually test it yourself. I think it's Snowflake, right? I I, I one of them did, yes. Yeah. Um, thanks class. <laughs> next class, yes. Anyway. I, how do I say this? There hasn't, like, I enjoy this because it's like, I, I find, I love databases, but like, there was a lot of back and forth like this in the 80s and 90s. Less so in the 2000s because it was mostly like, it was Hadoop versus the relational databases stuff. Uh, it's good to see this ga kind of gang violence. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, not, I'm surprised there hasn't been more of it. And I, and I think what'll happen is, as the money gets tight for the, these startups, uh, well, not startups, because they have, you know, they have, they raise hundreds of millions. Um, I think you might see more of this kind of like back and forth, um, just to get, get an edge over customers. But in the end, again, performance matters, sure. But like, if it, like a ten percent difference between one system and the next, probably not going to matter as much as like, you know, what's the overall experience of using this, using the database? Like, how much time you have to spend tuning stuff and managing stuff yourself? That matters a lot. All right, cool. Um, I want to finish up quickly about some additional things. So this, this lecture, the last lecture, we made a big, big deal about, hey, the query optimizer doesn't know what the data looks like because it's a bunch of, bunch of random files sitting on the data lakes. And so the activity helps with some things, but obviously the more you know in the beginning before you start generating a query plan, the better decisions, a better position you're going to be to make, make good decisions. So the thought then, then comes up, OK, well, what if there was something for data lakes, a storage service? that could support the kind of operations that people want to do for data lakes, like you know, bulk loading data or incremental changes. And then as the data arrived, the system could then compute statistics that it could then feed into, uh, into your, your, you know, your OLAP engine. And so they did this. This is what Delta Lake is. Um, so in 2019, they announced, uh, Databricks announced we have this thing called Delta Lake. And the way you think of it is, is a, it's a transactional data store that provides basic insert, update, delete operations and, and some scans over uh, structured data that's going to be stored in your data lake, right, on top of your S3 or whatever, uh, whatever object store you're using. So the way it basically works is that it's, it's, it's a transactional system. And you make, you make updates to, to data, to, to your tables. It's going to append entries into a log. And then there'll be some background job that occasionally wakes up, goes, grabs all the things you had in your log, converts them to parquet files, which then computes statistics that get put into the file, and then registers that with the, the your data catalog. So now when you know Spark gets a query on some stuff that's stored in Delta Lake, it has the the it has the op, it has the, the calculated statistics to help it make a decision about what, it, what what the data actually looks like. Right? So again, this is this is a natural progression to uh, to this kind of to, you know for, for an OLAP engine. Snowflake has not exactly the same thing, but they have their own little OLTB system they put in front of it can, can get some information. 
right? Again, this is from their from their point of view, from the system itself. Like if, if you can one charge people for inserting their data, collect some statistics, then it makes your system you know look even better. This, this is a clear win. But they weren't the first people to think of this idea. Cloudera did this, 2015. Who here has ever heard of Kudu? You don't count. You don't count. <laughs> okay, two. So basically the same idea, right? That this was a transactional uh, storage layer that could ingest data. You could do CRUD operations on them in transactions. It would be able to compute statistics, and then uh, that could then be fed into Paula for how they, how they run queries. Right? I'm not saying Kudu and Delta Lake are exactly the same. But the high-level idea, of the, the goal is, is, is very similar. Okay. When we talk about Iceberg and, and uh, Hootie next, next class, they, they work basically the same way as well. All right, so in my opinion with Photon, the, the two most interesting parts about it is that it's, it's how it uses the pre-compiled pre primitive idea from vector-wise and how they do the, again, what, I, what I'm calling horizontal operator fusion, and as well as the discussion of, like, you know, here's the pros and cons of different trade-offs we just we made. But then also how they, had, how they had to integrate with the existing you know, Java uh, interface or Java runtime that already existed. So without disrupting uh, users and without you know, having to rewrite everything from scratch and switch over. So obviously a main takeaway from all of this would be if you're going to build an OLAP engine today from scratch, do not use Java, do not use Scala, do not use the JVM. You need complete control over everything and you want to implement it in C++. Or, well. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. OK? We need a little button for you, just like every time. Rust, rust, <laughs> rust. OK? All right, any questions? All right, next class, Snowflake. And again, this will be, uh, it again, be the same thing. We'll see a lot of the same ideas, but we'll talk about what parts of a Snowflake are unique. OK? All right, guys, enjoy Carnival. Have a good weekend. It's going to be nice out. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. <laughs> What is it? Yes, it's the S P Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. You homies on the cup, so yeah, I'm a fool cause I drink proof. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come, Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Dip One, South Park and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party By the 12-pack case of the 40 A six-pack 40 act gets the real bounce I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12-ounce They say Bill makes you fat But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter <laughs>